right, so I'm Brian Cardell, developer advocate at Egalia. Uh, Eric Meyer, who's usually here also, is on vacation. Hope he's enjoying that. Uh, but today we'll be talking about two features that are suddenly shipping in stable browsers that, well, I'm very excited about, uh, Focus Visible and Inert. And I have not one, but two <laughs> guests that I'm really excited about. So I, I had a kind of fortunate inside track on both of these because I, I sort of contributed to them with two of my friends who I think did the most of the work, um, who were at Google at the time, uh, Alice Boxall and Rob Dodson. And uh, yeah, do you want to quickly introduce yourselves? Sure. Uh, hey, so I'm, I'm Rob. Uh, I used to work at Google. I was a developer advocate on the Chrome team. Yeah, uh, I'm Alice Boxall. I used to work at, <laughs> at Google on the Chrome team. I used to work at Google on the Chrome team. Um, I was, yeah, I was implementing features in Blink and working on uh, web platform stuff. Yeah, so like the funny thing is, is that like I was very excited about uh, like the fact that they're shipping now. And I thought like, oh, it would be great if like the three of us got together to talk on, on the podcast. And so, uh, well, for, should we start by like saying what they are? How about that? Like, let's, who, who, who wants to explain? Okay. Um, all right. Well, let's start with, uh, we'll start with Focus Visible because that's the first one in the show notes. So Focus Visible is a CSS, um, pseudo class and it matches when the browser would itself have drawn a focus indicator and around a particular element. The reason why this is interesting is in the past, this behavior was, was kind of inconsistent between browsers. And even if you were um, on a browser and you were using something like the, the focus CSS pseudo class, its behavior would be different from the browser's sort of like underlying behavior that it would use for particular elements, which caused lots and lots of confusion. So Focus Visible hopefully brings these things much more in line and makes them much more consistent and predictable for developers. The other one is inert. And inert is an HTML attribute that you can put on, I guess, any element, uh, but primarily interesting for interactive elements. And what inert will do is it will make that element uh, no longer focusable, and it will remove that element and all of its descendants from the accessibility tree. And this is really helpful if you have something, a good example is you, you take some big interactive thing and maybe you like kind of animate it off screen so it's not visible anymore. That doesn't mean that it's no longer interactive, right? And so it's very easy to create these situations where you have some you know, big menu or something like that, you've moved it off screen, but someone using a, a switch device or screen reader could maybe still inadvertently access that. And that's not really an experience that the developer is expecting, but that's one that they have kind of created by accident. And so inert lets you very quickly and efficiently remove those things so that users don't end up in these unexpected states. How'd I do? Yeah, I think good, good description. Magnificent. Yeah. Thank so, you. so both of these things are are shipping, and I thought like, oh, it would be so fun to have uh, an excuse to have Alice and Rob on and hang out with them and talk about this and celebrate together this moment because it, it has been a, a big effort. And so, congratulations, first of all. Yay! Yeah, I want. I don't want to mess up the podcast, but if I could, I'd like shoot some confetti right now because <laughs> it is like. I think you have it here in the notes, Brian. It was like seven year journey or something like that. Just a, a ton of time. Yeah. So I was just going to say that like the first thing when I, in, when I sent the invite, I was like, wow, how did this start? <laughs> like, I don't, I don't remember. And I went back and began looking and I found that, yeah, it's taken seven years. And that, that's an interesting thing to talk about. Cause like there are certainly bigger features than this. Right. And it still took seven years. Um, <clears throat> so we can maybe, I think it would be interesting to talk about the history of that and like the challenges and, you know, like just how it went. So I don't like, I don't know where it would even make sense to start. Like, does anybody have like a, I don't remember which one was first. Do you? I think the Focus Visible might've been first, but I do 
sort of have the sense that they were around a similar time. Yeah, they were very, they were very like close. I remember, and um, I think also this is how I met both of you. Like, I, I, I know I followed both of you online, but I, I, I'm pretty sure this might be how we got to talking about like lots of deep stuff. That that might be another interesting topic. Is that people might think, oh, you worked on two features for seven years. Like, no, it was like a whole bunch of things, and some of those have shipped, and some of them have not shipped. But yeah, some of them are still in the making. So yeah, so I think one of the, the interesting things about this process that you were alluding to, Brian, is um, how when you start working on these things, it kind of leads in these different directions. You start thinking up new new standards that could be added, um, but it's only once you're like in the space, right? You're really like deep in the subject matter that suddenly the inspiration strikes and you're like, ah, it would be also really cool if we did this. Or, you know, you're realizing you're, you're putting too much into one standard and you realize, you know what, I think what we actually need is to break this up into some smaller pieces that could do these different things. So there's one example that comes to mind with Focus Visible that we can talk about uh, a little bit later. But yeah, it's just a very interesting process how, like you're saying, you, you start pulling this thread and yeah, it takes seven years. But as that's happening, you're, you're also, you're, you start going in all these different, exploring all these different other avenues. Um, while you're still trying to keep this one track going to get it to the finish line. Yeah, and it changed along the way, right? I'm not sure. I, I think it might like actually have been my fault that it changed along the way. Um, because uh, we we began talking about, at, le- at least Focus Visible was the first one that I think was shared publicly. And we began like trying to dissect the problem. And like some of that started on Twitter. Alice found <laughs> some tweets that she put in the show notes. Yeah, like yeah, I was trying to sort of do do the um archaeology there to try and remember because I distinctly remembered starting a conversation with you on Twitter about what Marcy Sutton at the time had referred to as button focus hell. Um yes. so you you had asked like when would you not want to see a focus ring? So I was yeah, I responded something along the lines of well, you're on a mobile device, you've clicked a button then this weird ring shows up, tells you nothing. It gives you no useful information. It's just sort of this weird thing that looks like a bug. So I think that was that was sort of what sparked that discussion. Yeah, and then we got really into it. We had like a lot of discussions and I was saying like, well, I know for me, the reason I ask is because I wasn't thinking about mobile at all. I was thinking about my computer and I'm kind of a mixed mode user. Like I, I use my mouse and I use the tab key. And sometimes I'm like, where is focus? I don't, I don't know. So like, I, I frequently really appreciate them. And when they when they just sort of disappear for some reason that I can't understand it, I find it a little bit confusing. But like that led to this whole thing that led to like Alice explaining things to me that I really never even noticed existed. They're like really subtle things. Like Alice was saying, if you push a button, that feels wrong and it's not new that browsers didn't do that right and then that also got into this discussion about like well but that's what focus matches right and it it isn't even consistent so i think we spent a long time like just thinking about the problem and describing the problem and trying to find like where there was some agreement and then we wrote an article about it uh that was published in o'reilly where we had proposed actually a media query basically called modality, input modality, that would let you say like the user is using it in this modality and the modality could switch and you could change which style, like which things were being applied. I think that wrong term was my fault. (laughs) Wait, this is maybe a good question because this is a question I always had and maybe this was explained to me at some point and it just sort of like lost in my mind, but... So it started with a media query, and in some ways, the media query is like very easy to interpret, right? It's like, if modality is mobile, then do this with focus. Or if modality is VR, do this. Or if it's desktop, do this. And y'all mentioned at one point that it was sort of discussed, and people did not like that idea. But do you remember why they didn't like it? Yeah, it's it's interesting. So like shortly after we wrote that article, I don't know, Alice, do you? like recall like how it happened if it like if you took it internally to somebody or they like 
just picked up on the fact that we were talking about it or I, 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 I no longer remember, but I assume that it, yeah, it was something like that, that I went and chatted with some folks on the blink team, like, Hey, what do you think about this? Um, and you made a note that <laughs> you recall that it was a performance issue. Yeah. Um, I, I recall that, um, suddenly like the blink team was asking if they could have a meeting with me, which was like, had never happened to me before. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And they were like, we really like this idea that you and Alice came up with. But the thing is like, it's actually every time a media query happens, it changes, like it injects a whole new style sheet or it removes a whole new style sheet. And that means like you have to recalculate kind of everything. Whereas with a pseudo class, we just flip a bit and it's predictable. It's, it's a very linear path to resolve what matches that, right? We know exactly what it affects. So they yeah. said it was considerably more performant to not use a media query. They're worried that modality, like somebody could, if they're a mixed user like me, they might switch modality, right? Like they might start using the keyboard. Yeah, that, that actually, so I wanted to clarify a point about the, the question Rob asked. So, which, which also brings me back to something that I was meaning to say in my explanation earlier, which is that it, the, the modality was not like what type of device is the user using? The modality is how is the user currently like using their input device? So it was less kind of like, are they, are they permanently on a phone? Are they permanently on VR? Are they permanently on a desktop? Then are they currently using a pointer mode or are they currently using a I think that the term we, we tried to, we tried to come up with a few terms. I think the term we came up with, it was like a sequ sequential focus mode, which is the mode right. where like, typically it'll be a keyboard. Um, it could also be like a switch device, but the idea being that you are moving the page focus sequentially through the focusable items. And you want to know which focusable item currently has that focus. The other point that I wanted to make is that the example that I gave on Twitter, like I'm not even sure whether that was ever accurate, but I'm pretty sure it's not now. Like I don't think that we show focus rings on mobile, but I'm not, I haven't actually checked that. This is just a vague oh, memory. So I think that this was, I mean, this is totally worth discussing. I think Android used to, and it may have been if you had modified the default appearance of it, but it would show like a, I think it would show like an orange ring. I'm pretty sure it did that. Because I, I have this vague recollection of like we had like a drop down menu or something and like an old Polymer website that did it on Android. Right. And so the like... modifying the appearance thing that is when you lose that OS default, which you were talking about in your initial description, Rob. Yeah, it's maybe helpful. I, I mean, I don't know if it's people <laughs> people want to go this deep, but it might be helpful for anyone listening who isn't like really really steeped in focus to understand the rules of focus, which we could talk about a little bit, like the, the how it's roughly supposed to work and then why it was like really inconsistent. Because otherwise it, it maybe doesn't make much sense why we invested so much time in focus visible. Yeah. Well I can I can talk about the things in the article and we, we can link to the article, but there there's some examples that are just very, very clear that I think mm -hmm. Alice just nailed when she described them. So like <clears throat> on a mobile device, if you touch a form field for your password <laughs> like you want to be really sure where that password is going right like it's very critical that you know where the virtual keyboard is going to send your keys uh you don't want them accidentally sending them to the chat or something right so you, you show a focus ring on those but uh all the way back to i think ie4 there had been discussions about like well bug reports people click on a button and it gets a focus ring and people are like, that feels wrong. Why? What is this ring? Because like they were primarily mouse users, you know, and they didn't get focus rings on lots of other things. And that's actually the way that the focus pseudo class worked, too. And so the net result of this is that like browsers had certain kinds of rules for when you would show the focus ring. And it's more subtle than that, which is one of those places where we spiraled off briefly, which is like the focus navigation starting point. Well, just versus... to jump, 
yeah, just to jump on that really quick, like, so it, it, it's even like, it, it was even sort of like inconsistent browser to browser. So as an example, Chrome, if you had not modified the default appearance of a button when you clicked on it with a mouse. So if you literally just write button in HTML and you click on it with a mouse, I don't think this is the behavior today, but it was a few years ago. You click on it with a mouse, the default button, it does not show a focus ring. If you do anything to change the appearance of that button, like you change its background color and you click on it with a mouse, it does show a focus ring. But that behavior was specific to Chrome. And if you go to Safari, you click on a button, it doesn't really matter what you've done to the button. It just doesn't focus the button at all. Yeah. So in Chrome, it actually focuses the button, but there's this like underlying magic that it's doing to be like, should I draw a ring or should I not draw a ring? In Safari, it's just like, I'm just not even gonna focus this element, which means it's firing you know, different events as well, right? Like on Chrome, it's gonna fire a focus event. In Safari, I believe it doesn't. And I think, I can't remember which of the two behaviors Firefox had, but so, right, so you've got these like layers of just like weirdness to this mm -hmm, thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and they weren't consistent and there was no way to say the thing that the browser does, that's what I want to do, <laughs> right? There was like literally no way to do that. And so there was this like underlying magic in the browser that was like, uh, even if you can't be sort of like 100% consistent somehow because of operating system, like different platform weirdness, like at least I want this to be very, very predictable. And what we what we found, we like looked through a bunch of things. We talked to different people and like we found that people would end up like disabling focus rings because or focus indicators because like they wanted to style them because like you have say a blue background and the default ring is blue <laughs> and you're like that doesn't work i need to make this white if you style it if you touch it at all suddenly like everything would start working weird and very very inconsistently across browsers and oh, yeah. users, <laughs> users would file a lot of bugs that was that was the other funny thing. Yeah, you write a you write a focus style, and now yeah, you're in a it, it, it's like forcing it to like just always be on all the time. You've like escaped out of the browser's like sort of nice subtle behavior to having it like show up way more than you were expecting. So yeah, to your point, people would do that and be like, "That's not what I wanted. Let's just get rid of this thing." Right. And uh, I, <laughs> like ironically, so for anyone listening, like. As we were starting this podcast, we realized literally the site that we were using to record this podcast does not have focus states on any of the buttons. Um, Cause we were trying to, I, I was trying to find a shortcut for the mute button. And Alice was like, oh, if you press spacebar, it works. And I'm like, what, how, what? Like, and then realized like, there's no focus states. Like you just, if you're just having around, you can't see anything, but if you get lucky, you can hit spacebar and yes, mute this thing. So it's a great example of, I don't know what the, team behind this product, like why they chose to do that. But it's very likely these are very custom looking buttons that they have on here. And yeah, they probably style the button, a ring showed up when they weren't expecting it. And they were like, mm, let's just get rid of this. Yeah. So um, the, so the reason that it didn't become a style sheet was performance. Um, They're worried that we would create sort of too many things that would potentially switch too often to be performant. Um, I don't know how true that is in reality, to be honest, because um, sort of container queries now are similar. Like you have a lot of rules and they, they kick in at like all kinds of times. Um, but it was a reasonable argument anyway. And also there was a pre-existing Moz focus ring pseudo class that was Mozilla specific extension, like prefix extension. And it like, it was effectively very, very similar. Like it, it never really articulated itself super well, but the intent was kind of the same. So we went the pseudo class route and we rewrote the little polyfill we had for it. And then like it sat for a while and maybe i don't know it wasn't that long and i used it uh, and found some things that i was like oh well now that i use it there's the thing that i didn't expect 
you know, and we tweaked it a little bit. And then I think, is this the one that got picked up by, I think it got picked up by Slack, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think they were, they were using it pretty early on. Um, yeah, and, and Twitter too, maybe it was using it. Yep. And they both also gave some feedback where it was like, ah, we did this thing that you didn't expect and got this result that we don't expect, right? Yeah. So the the example that I was looking into um, when I was kind of trying to refresh my memory and sort of like that, that I remembered as like an interesting problem and that I've even had discussions with sort of in, in the last year, just with friends who are developers um, after, as this has been coming out, they're like, oh, why does it work this way? So I was interested to go back and remember exactly why we made these decisions. So the problem um, that they were having was that a user would press a keyboard shortcut, like a command key shortcut to open their like little side menu that sort of, yeah, that has all of the, 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 the sort of the right hand menu um, that has sort of some interesting stuff in it. Uh, power users would hit a keyboard shortcut to open that menu and it would pop into focus visible mode because they pressed a key. And sort of that was our heuristic is like, if you're, if you press a key, um, we were going to pop you into focus visible mode. Um, And the next thing that gets focus or like the current thing that has focus will show a short focus ring or rather will match the focus visible pseudo. So they were, they were, they were like this, well, this guy Todd working there was like, yeah, this is, this is not working for us. Uh, it's really, it's putting us back into this um, button focus hell kind of scenario that Marcy described where users are just constantly filing bugs. Like, why is this, why is this ugly ring showing up when I've just hit a keyboard shortcut? Like, it doesn't make sense. Um, and initially I was sort of resistant. I was like, well, but uh, a keyboard based user would definitely want, would definitely be using that shortcut and would definitely want to see the focus style. So there was kind of like a bit of tension there for a while. And then sort of some more, the Todd gave some more examples. Um, and I think some other developers sort of popped onto the thread to say, yeah, that we've had this problem too. And yeah, eventually I think that, yeah, the, the three of us were sort of like convinced um, that, that that was not the right choice. And I think at the, looking back through the thread, it looked like at the time we changed the heuristic to be the only tab and shift tab um, can change mode. But I believe now that that has since been revised. Um, My recollection last time I looked, and I think it may have even changed since then, was that a command, a command slash control key combo um, or like a meta key combo won't, change or change it into focus visible mode any other key press will is my yeah that, so that, got... no, that sounds right to me right because there's other there, i remember there's also cases where it's like um you made a thing that's like content editable or something and um you know like you you press keys they're like letter keys or something and well you, you you want that to work, you know? Yeah. Or well, the um, other example that sort of always comes to mind for me is like a spin button. So maybe you've clicked on this thing, but like, you know, even in my case, like I, I really don't like sort of trying to use the mouse for those things. I sort of like to click it to get focus and then use the arrow keys for kind of like the fine adjustment. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of nice if I start pressing keys to know, okay, yeah, the keys are going to the right place. So yeah. So we sort of like that, that's you know just one example of kind of the details that we that you're forced to think about once you're actually trying to standardize something. Um, yeah. You know when you're trying to write something when you're we're trying to write the spec text and we're trying to you're trying to like make the implementation that is going to work be be everything to everyone. It probably cooked for I don't know a, a year year and a half something like that. We got feedback. We made changes. We got new insights. We made some changes. And then like it, it kind of sat there for a while and then Agalia, uh, so Agalia works on web browsers and, um, like we have this model where we work with a single client. And so like we have somebody like Bloomberg, Bloomberg tech come in and say, um, we're really interested in this grid spec, but like 
it's not getting the priority that it needs and like we'll hire you to do that work and that's awesome but uh when i was here first i was like well like but why does it have to be one company that pays because like that's better than you know uh, the the browser vendors plus the companies that agalia contracts with is better than just the browser vendors but like why does it matter if the money came from three people or, or three organizations. We have this idea for talking about the complexities of prioritization and like how investment in the platform works. And like, there's a lot to unwind here. I mean, you can look at this podcast, like we have a whole series of web ecosystem health that like digs into all different aspects of this. And so we ran this experiment to kind of start that conversation called open prioritization. And we had to make this list of features that were call them like shovel ready products, right? Like things that like we could get to work on that weren't controversial, that were just needing priority, uh, needing implementation in some browser. And we wanted to get like a real mix of things. We wanted to get like something in HTML, and something in CSS and some things in JavaScript maybe, and maybe things that were the last implementation versus the second to the last implementation or even maybe the first implementation. But we didn't want it to be overwhelming. So we, we picked six things and both Focus Visible and Inert um, were on our list in no small part probably because I was on the panel advocating that they should be. So we did this and both Focus Visible and Inert were kind of like the two finalists like other people agreed with us with their pocketbook like they said we'll kick in a dollar or ten dollars or fifty dollars or five thousand dollars right uh, and it was people and organizations and when you look at actually the the real money that was raised it was primarily from just a very few donations that were from like companies like the amp project uh pledged $10,000 toward whichever one the rest of the community chose. So I think that's great because it gave like developers a view into the complexities of prioritization. And like, we have to pick one, like it's one is what we can pick. Right. And here's sort of what it's going to take to get it done. And, you know, now like go out and help raise awareness and, and find the, the, companies to help back it up and so that was cool and focus visible won. and part of the reason that that got on the list is because uh mozilla picked it up and so it was the easy argument that's the last implementation of that one and what's interesting here is that like when mozilla implemented like they also had questions like they added more tests and they were like hey what about this and we were like wow I guess we have to talk about that now, right? Uh, so the second implementation added some more tests. It clarified a few things. Um, it made sure that we were consistent in a way that we weren't when there was only the one implementation. And then when it won, Focus Visible is the one that won, and Reiko did it, um, he found a bunch more tests that like, he had questions about. And this is actually really common, that like the third one this like the second and the third one ask questions that the first one didn't. It seems to me. I don't know. What do you agree or no? I think so. I also think focus visible is such a can of worms. Like because focus behavior itself was never specced really that well. And I think Alice did like a great job of of trying in the spec to write out like here is here is the behavior and all the sort of like decision tree branches that this could go down. But previously that didn't exist, right? And so it definitely makes sense. There's a lot of questions based on that. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, like the, the fact that normally it's uh, each implementation winds up coming at it with different people and fresh eyes. And sometimes they ask questions that like we didn't think about and that were like, well, this isn't consistent and like does that matter like how much does that matter going through the exercise absolutely improved it it took a long time but like the end result is that browsers will answer this 
very, very much more consistently than they ever have. And like you said, Rob, the all of these things were very sort of inconsistent and underspecified. In fact, they're not the only things about focus. Uh, we had sort of like a, a huge document that we made of all of the spiral out of questions. <laughs> And somewhere along the way, I don't know how it's, it is linked up when I looked at the, when I looked at the notes and I I don't know how Dominic wound up deciding to open this focus meta bug, but it it included a lot of those things that we talked about. Yeah. I suspect that might have come more out of um, custom elements and trying to think about what, what do custom elements need to be able to specify about their own focusability and focus states? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I don't know for sure, but I suspect that was kind of the origin of that meta bug. Yeah, if you follow through like all of the links in all of the GitHub issues, you will go around in circles for a really long time. <laughs> Um, they will spread out far and wide because um, like, I remember one of the things that I was interested in very, very early on is like when I created a custom element, can't I specify which one of these it is? Like, can't I pass an argument to say like, you're texty, (laughs) like you, you act more like a text box versus you act more like a button. And it took took a while, but through a lot of those things, there's a, a whole like tree of issues there. And um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's I think it's very interesting. I'm just it is actually more consistent than I imagined it would be in in so many cases. Um, yeah, and in fact, we we initially I think had a position that we didn't necessarily have consistency as a goal. Um, right. Right. So earlier, yeah, earlier on, like the first sort of draft of the spec text was deliberate about saying browsers can choose their own heuristics because we didn't want one browser saying, we think it should work this way to kind of be a blocker to yep. implementing it. We were sort of like, the the critical thing is that there is a way to say, do what the browser does because without it, we end up with this like these these fail states where either you get this confusing focus ring where you don't want to see it, or in order to avoid that, developers are just switching off all of the focus rings. Mm-hmm. Um, and both of those were, yeah, fail states that we were explicitly trying to avoid that were just kind of the status quo at the time. Um, yeah. So we were saying, yes, we we sort of encourage this idea that the heuristics can be different between browsers and can change over time um, as we sort of better understand this very poorly understood space of focus behavior um, yeah. where you sort of got different different browsers, sorry, different, you've got different operating systems that have made different choices for how their platform should behave mm-hmm. um, based on sort of various things one of the things that I sort of realized is that I think the reason that on on Mac OS, when you click a button, it doesn't get focus. Um, and it sort of, it took me years to understand. Um, and finally, with the help of one of the WebKit engineers, that the reason for that is because there is a platform expectation that you will be able to use the arrow keys to scroll the page mm-hmm. in the majority of cases. So you want to focus as few things as possible on click. Um, And that is sort of a platform-wide choice that they've made. And naturally, they want to be consistent across the platform with that choice. Um, Versus on on Windows, they sort of, I think, very early on made a choice that we want want to focus more things um, so that you can interact with them with the keyboard, is my my assumption. Yeah. I think on Mac OS 2, if you, if you hit the space bar, it scrolls the page too, whereas it would click the button again if it was uh, focused. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. An interesting thing here to me is that the act of going through these conversations is that like everybody wants to be sure, even though we leave a lot of room for interpretation, like does this sort of fall in the boundary of 
the expected kind of divergence from norms? Or are we actually going to wind up in a situation where like we just again disincentivize? Like like you said, Alice, with the um early use in Slack, they were like, no, this puts us back in a button hell, right? When nobody wants to recreate an old problem with a new solution. It was slow, but there was a lot of really careful thought. And I think I think there were actually changes made to literally all of the browsers, like not huge ones, but a little bit. And we aligned in ways that I thought were probably not going to happen at the outset. And I feel like that's kind of a win, right? Like we took some of the inconsistency and frustration out of the system after really careful review and left it where we think it actually is beneficial. Yeah, my thinking on this is that I, I feel and I hope that focus visible is better than the old focus uh, pseudo class. Like the behavior is just sort of more consistent and more what developers expect. But also a big part of what I learned in the process is like focus is tricky because there are times where the, the browser just doesn't know enough about what the user is doing or the developer's intention to mm -hmm. make like the best guess. And so it's very tricky when you're trying to build a selector that, that is doing that, is essentially doing that guesswork. So in the case of Slack and them wanting to say, oh, when I hit a keyboard shortcut, I want to move focus into this uh, new panel that has opened up. You know, then we started to think, well, like maybe we need to have a way to give focus even more information. So for instance, um, there's this concept of focus navigation start point mm -hmm. where you're saying, I'm not actually going to focus a control. Like I'm not going to like put focus on a button. I'm just going to put it on like a region of the page, like a, like a div or a section element. And so if the user were to then press their tab key, it would move to the first interactive element in, in that region, right? So we're like, oh, maybe that's what Slack wants. Or another option is like, can you give arguments to the, the programmatic focus API to be like, I'm calling programmatic focus here. So maybe suppress the focus ring because I really, really, as the developer, I really know what I'm doing in this moment. And, and I'm telling you explicitly is like what to do. Um, so those are all like possible avenues that one could build on top of. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why this process is so interesting, right? You get so in the weeds and then you're like, oh, I see how we can keep building on this. But that's the, fundamentally, I think that's the tricky part about focus is you're having to make a guess a lot of the time, or at least the way that the current focus selectors work. It's not dissimilar from the way the like responsive images sort of used to work. Mm -hmm. And then you added source set and you added sizes. And with those two attributes, you're like, okay, well now the browser knows some stuff and the developer knows some stuff. And we use these two in combination to, to fill in the gaps and, and you get a good experience. And I, I feel like focus visible is like a start down that road, but there's actually probably still a lot more work that could be done to, to even build on top of it, to give developers even more fine grain control. So it's, it's exactly the behavior that they want. Oh yeah, there's definitely there's definitely so much more. I mean, I, I think we still have open questions about custom elements, for example. Um, yeah, yeah. Last I checked, um, the issue, uh, the the GitHub issue about specifying focus states for custom elements is still open. Um, I don't know where those conversations have gone um, elsewhere, um, but this sort of made me think of another. Uh, so talking about like understanding what developers want. Um, reminded me of another thing, which is that different different users will have different needs and different preferences um, as well. Um, so one of the things that we decided to do in Chrome um, was to add a preference, um, which so the the preference does two things actually. Uh, so the preference, the way the preference is worded and the effect that it has is that whenever something gets focused, you get like a little temporary, very, very bold two-tone focus ring. So it's it's white and uh, blue. So sort of it pops against any background um, that shows up and it's quite large as well. That shows up for a couple of seconds and then fades out. So if you are someone with sort of, yeah, who really needs to understand where focus has gone, um, you can turn that preference on and you'll get this, this very bold focus ring that is drawn by the browser. 
but it also opts you in secretly to focus visible always matches on the focused element. So any author style that uses the focus visible class will always match when that preference is on. Um, yeah. And so that was just our way of sort of trying something to try and accommodate users who really prefer to always understand where focus is, even if it's sort of, even if we sort of guess that it's not going to be relevant to them in that moment. Yeah, I, I actually love that. Um, I, I think I think it was a surprise to me, actually. I think there were some other things happening with, um, there was a, a spatial navigation spec that was being worked on at the time that uh, we like had some interest and also like concerns to make sure that it like doesn't create some new interesting kinds of problems. And in, in talking about that, we were talking about like, well, look at the cases that it's solving and like, is should they really even be moving focus? And we wound up in these discussions where we were talking about like roving tab index and like why that's necessary. And maybe there should be a different way to do that. Uh, there's a focus group proposal now, which is kind of cool. I don't know if either of you remember this, but uh, we had this conversation with Joni, who is uh, in a galleon, uh, before I came to a galleon, in the bar at TPAC in France, I believe. And I I still remember she called it, um, we were like, we need a name for this. And she called it like Locus of Focus, <laughs> which I loved. But yeah, there's so many bits to this and so many things to to think about and so many ways to spiral out into other interesting parts, many of which are still not solved. But it doesn't mean that they're not started to be solved. They might be stalled, but these things move slowly. So look, we have talked for a long time and we didn't even talk about inert. So how about if we switch and talk about inert? Inert also, we began as a polyfill. Inert is really interesting because you you kind of, you sort of can polyfill it pretty well because you could, in theory, actually do all the things that Inert did, but it was very complicated. Like it was, you had to juggle a lot of complicated stuff to do it. And like Inert as a concept exists already for dialogues and it's, necessary to say that everything that isn't the dialogue is on the top layer and everything else is inert you can't keyboard focus to it it doesn't get click events all that kind of stuff and i remember us discussing that and like well but there are use cases for that that are not just for dialogue that that's interesting for all kinds of other reasons and there's not an attribute for it. But interestingly, like, I think there was an attribute for it, right? Like, I'm looking at the show notes and I see there's all these, like, pull requests on HTML that's, like, remove inert, re-add inert. Yeah, I, I think when Dialog was originally being specced, they specified this concept of inert. And I think they were just like, eh, why not? Let's, why not just give it an attribute? And then, you know, it was in there for a little while. And then I think, I can't remember exactly why they decided to take it out. Maybe they were like, oh, no one's, no one's implemented this. Yeah, let's just take it out, is my understanding. Yeah. Well, it, sort of, it sort of seemed like, like my perception of this coming in from the outside was that dialogue had almost like run aground. And like, like I remember wanting dialogue to be a thing and then i kept hearing like oh it's oh this is maybe not gonna happen it's all messed up or something and inert felt almost like this uh it, it, it was smaller right like the scope of it was a lot smaller and so folks on sort of the browser side were kind of more inclined to be like well maybe you could do that as like a starting point or something and so i felt like we we sort of stole that piece out of dialogue land and started working on it because people were amenable to it and you could you could build dialogues with it if you used it in like a clever way of saying oh, i've got a dialogue over here and everything else will be inert but then brian as you mentioned it also had interesting use cases beyond just dialogues right but i just always thought that was interesting where like and because when it finally ended up like i feel like dialogue and inert have 
basically landed almost at the same time. I, I was just gonna, I was just gonna <laughs> mention that they, they did actually land at the same time, and well, like, it um, totally didn't seem that way at first. It seemed like dialogue was was done. Yeah, yeah. It, so it seemed like dialogue was done, but it seemed like dialogue was done for a few reasons because, like, on the one hand, there was like a community of people who are like, the existing dialogue is wrong. Like, it, it's not right. There are things that we don't agree on. And then another thing that I can maybe take some responsibility for is there was, this is the only event anywhere that I can point to where somebody argued that, like, maybe we should stop pursuing that because Extensible Web says we should focus on these primitives. So, like, let's not push on that until we have these primitives. So I think there was like a brief backing off of the sort of pushing really, really hard to get dialogue done. But I think that that also was like, there were real things that people disagreed with and we did just manage to sort out all those things. And it took about the same amount of time to do both. So I'm glad we have both actually. Um, But maybe it would be possible to have dialogue earlier. I'm not sure. Yeah, we stuck the landing, I guess. It worked out. Yeah. yeah. We ended up getting some of the extensible web bits along the way within our... I think so. I think so. Speaking of polyfills, I, I was like looking at the show notes and we had had some discussion about the inert polyfill. So I feel like both Focus Visible and Inert were good examples where the approach of put something in the WICG Mm. And put a polyfill out there and like get feedback is really helpful. Alice, did you want to talk at all about the letting items break out of their like inert parent thing and sort of the thinking around that? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I was, I was trying to remember how we came to that decision not to like for inert to be a one way street, basically. So you put an inert attribute on an element and then everything in it, all of its descendants are inert and there's no way, there's no way to kind of escape out of it. And I think, I think that our thinking at the time was it becomes a coordination problem because then, yeah, sort of like if you don't, if you're not sort of like having a top-down approach um, with all of the components on the page, you know, if you then import some component that just decides to have, say, inert equals false um, on one of its elements, it doesn't it doesn't need any kind of permission to do that. It's just suddenly it's popped out of inert. Or if it was, and again, like it's it's not clear that this was valid reasoning, but if it was in an iframe and something in an iframe decided, well, I just want to make sure that this ad is not inerted that we sort of like we didn't want to sort of expose developers to that problem we wanted to make it just very predictable what's going to happen when you apply that attribute and another sort of like sort of api style issue is that having it as a proper boolean attribute which is like true if it's there false if it's not is just a bit nicer um, and Mm -hmm. a bit easier to use So you don't have this kind of thing that we have with a lot of the ARIA attributes, for example, where you have to put a string, you have to put equals true or equals false. So I think that was another part of it. I definitely have seen sort of all along the way, including like now that it's shipping, people saying, no, I want this to work the other way around. I want it without saying in as many words necessarily, but saying I want it to work like dialogue works. Um, I want it to be the thing where you say this <clears throat> this element is not inert and everything else is inert, which we certainly discussed as uh, as a potential other additional direction that we could go in. So I remember we, like we talked at the time a lot about this idea of blocking elements. And I think um, someone on the Polymer team at the time even made sort of a, a polyfill of like a sketch that we had come up with for how that might work. So the idea would be, this is like a stack, a stack in the page of elements which are blocking the rest of the page. And this would be like another underlying primitive of dialogue where you put something in the top layer and it makes everything else in the page inert, but it wouldn't necessarily have the positioning and 
maybe not the backdrop. And yeah, it wouldn't necessarily have all of the features of dialogue, so it would be a slightly more um, granular API than dialogue is. And there's there's no reason why that still couldn't be done. I kind of, and I, again, like Brian was saying earlier on, it really comes down to prioritization and sort of what what is there the greatest need for the very limited resource, which is time um, mm. to be spent on things. So, you know, I think <laughs> I think we thought possibly incorrectly that shipping inert would cover the vast majority of use cases in the shortest amount of time. And maybe maybe it was the shortest amount of time. Maybe seven years was just the shortest amount of time that it could be done in. It's it's difficult to prove the the inverse somehow. I know like this is this is a very common conversation that I have that's like, um, well, this took this long. You know, like would this other thing have worked better? Well, like I don't know. Like maybe sometimes. <laughs> The most important thing in all of this is we ship the thing. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> because for every one thing that ships, there's like 20 things that didn't make it. And I I think it's it's awesome. Uh I think that's honestly, I think that's the best thing about custom elements and, and Shadow Dom is just that they exist. Um, because they're not the first runs at those problems. Those the, the first run started like 10 minutes after Tim posted the first HTML. Like everybody has wanted to do that stuff forever. And they got pretty serious with things like XBL and, you know, we just couldn't get it done. And here we have an interoperable thing that is shipping in all the browsers. And yes, it has flaws and yes, it has places where it's incomplete and places where probably it's even a little frustrating but it exists and that's a quality that none of those other things have. So, yeah. Um, and I, I think I want to pick up on something Rob was saying, this is the work of so many people. Um, right. So I wanted to pick up on what Rob was saying about the, you know, even though it took seven years, I, I feel really happy that we went through this incubation process. Folks that were using the polyfill and gave us this great feedback on what was what was working for them, but also that wasn't working for them. And I feel like we were often sort of very quick to give credit for, you know, the people writing the spec text, uh, the people that are sort of like loudly advocating for things um, or that sort of have their name on the git commit and... You know, I am, I'm personally, I'm so grateful to like everyone that made comments on the, on the polyfill sort of saying what was and wasn't working for them or that like raised issues about, you know, is this going to negatively impact certain types of user that this is absolutely a community effort sort of right down to the sort of like the last the last commits coming from Igalia from the open prioritization pro project um yeah it makes me really happy that so many people sort of like contributed to this work not to switch it back to the extensible web thing again but this is kind of the vision of that is like how do we enlist more people and the way that we think that you can do that is by like lowering the bar to participate so like not everybody can be part of seven years worth of conversation right like we we have a need now. And so like, if there's an opportunity to say, here's the thing, what about that enables more people to be involved. And I'm, I'm so grateful that we found people to like, give it a chance and try it out and then complain when it didn't work or say in places, this is almost really great, or it's exactly what I want. It's, it's so many people and it's possible because we did this, right? Like, I mean, it would be less people who would answer something that was like natively in a browser. And we have also since like really expanded like experimental platform features and origin trials. And I think there's all, all kinds of good things that allow more people to try a thing. But the polyfill is really nice because like you can use it on a real production thing like Slack, right? It doesn't have to be, you know, experimental or something that you might do. It can actually potentially help you solve your real problem 
So I, I love it. And actually, it doesn't stop, Alice, with uh, Egalia because uh, we got a commit a week or two ago to, I think it was the inert repo. Is that right? <laughs> uh, yeah. To fix I mean, a bug. Yeah. One of the wonderful things about it being on GitHub is that, like, I think filing a bug against a browser can sometimes feel like you're just writing a note, putting it in a bottle, and throwing it into the ocean. <laughs> but Actually, filing a bug on GitHub, I, I don't know why, but I mean, it just feels like you think someone's going to read this, you know, and, and maybe it's just because a lot of us spend a lot of time working on GitHub, our own work projects or personal projects are on there. Um, but I feel like the WICG being on GitHub has lowered that barrier of entry for people to give that feedback where previously it may have been intimidating or it may have just not felt like it would be heard if you go and write it in some browser's bug tracker. So I think that's also a big part of the community um, participation that's really valuable. Yeah. I And actually, like, I didn't realize until recently how widely used Inert was. Um, like, I, I see everybody would want Focus Visible, right? I mean, I, I understand why it won, really, because it's like, like, literally everybody has that problem. <laughs> like, it seems like maybe less people would have the inert problems but they're hard to solve if you don't have them but actually like it got over a hundred stars on on github and it's not the only polyfill there's also like at least one other really popular one so that's cool i mean it means that like a lot of people looked at it and a lot of people tried it out and a lot of people either found it acceptable and kept using it or gave us feedback so yay everybody <laughs> I, I think that's sort of like the system working as it should, even if it is still too slow. Yeah, I don't know. Do either of you have any other thoughts? I would like to throw one other thing in, actually, um, which is working on both of these has been like great because of both of you. And like five stars would work with again. So uh, I know like you're doing something else, but if there's ever opportunity for us to do something again, I would do it in a heartbeat. Yeah, likewise. Absolutely same. Do you think that there's anything that we missed here that is worth covering? I or wanted to give like a shout out to, um, and I've, I've been a little out of the loop lately, but um, Brian, are you still doing the open UI stuff? Yes, yes. I wanted to give a shout out. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if you just heard my dog shaking off very loudly, but I wanted to give a shout out to that work because I feel like kind of touching on your earlier point, you were saying that Focus Visible and Inert, like they did really well in these open prioritization things. And personally, as like a developer, I, I have at many times felt like browsers feel like they're focusing on stuff which is maybe novel or interesting, but like not often the things that are like my pain point that I experience every day as I'm trying to build web pages. So like, a, you know, the perfect example is like, I still can't style the select element, you know, and I shake my fist. And so I'm really, really excited for things like open UI and the work that y'all are doing there to try and say, hey, like there's still so much greenfield space around making it easier to build UI, right? And it doesn't all have to be like loading performance or I don't know, you know, whatever browsers seem to care about, but like sometimes I just want to build a widget that looks good, it works good, and that's still really, really, really hard. And so, shout out to that project because I think what y'all are doing there is awesome. Awesome. I actually I love that you expressed it the way that you expressed it because one of the things that has become a lot clearer to me, especially since like coming to Galia and seeing the things that people are interested in, why they're interested in them, and the complexities of wow, there's so much stuff. I mean, there's just so much stuff. The web has become like literally the foundation of our entire world. And when you have that many people, well, they're not all the same. That kind of stuff is like hard to uncover if you don't do a lot of digging about like what's important. And the priorities are just really, really complex. Like they're really complex. There's so many different angles to it. Yep, for sure. I'm happy you're fighting the good fight, Brian. Yeah, me too. All right. Well, uh, we should probably cut it because we're like an hour. But I just want to say thanks so much for uh, coming and talking to me because I, I always enjoy it when we get to sit down and talk. And hopefully other people will find some of this history and thought kind of interesting. So 
Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Alice. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Brian.